Thank you, Karen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1? It's so good to have Ray and Erlene and Bill with us. I understand y'all had a lot of activity near the house last night. They were right next door to the rodeo. What a beautiful night. How many of y'all went to the rodeo last night? Anybody in here? All right, quite a few. So glad y'all brought Florida weather with you. We're going to have another week of about 80 degrees, hopefully this week. So uh, I do have a confession to make. Our Sunday school lesson was on confessing. Um, I am preaching a message that I preached two weeks ago at a men's conference in Appomattox. There are two individuals here today, Stephen Miller and Noah Hickman can attest to that. So brothers, hang with me in it. I promise I've tweaked it a little bit. But um, God did give me this message a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to uh, share that. So we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. You know, in the fall of 1979, I was a freshman in high school, and I tried out for the high school cross-country team. Um, I was able to make the team because I'll be honest, there weren't that many people standing in line to run 3.2 miles over creeks and, and uh, around wooded area, long distance running. Uh, so I actually lettered that year uh, because of that. I don't say that boastfully because I think if you had two legs and could walk, you would have lettered. Uh, the program was so weak that they ended up disbanding the program the next year and it went about 20 years before it was revived, but I ran not because I loved long distance running. <clears throat> I ran because as a freshman, the cross country coach was the varsity basketball coach and I wanted to be on that team my sophomore year. Uh, but to show you how God works, that guy stayed one year and left the next year anyway. So I was <laughs> caught in the middle of that. Um, I was 5'9 and about 100 pounds less than I weigh now. And it was a true experience. But, you know, I learned a lot that one fall. In fact, arguably more than any experience in my life, I learned about the importance of personal discipline and endurance. I learned, as you'll hear in a few moments, about the importance of living according to the rules, according to the guidelines. I even learned that we need to finish the race in life strong. And so this morning, we're going to look at Paul's challenge to the church at Corinth. And really underlying that challenge is a truth that's very important for us to know today, that the Christian life is truly a long distance run, not a sprint. Now granted, there are exceptions to that. You've heard of deathbed conversions. I've had the blessing of seeing uh, at least a handful of those in my life where someone is lying on his or her deathbed <clears throat> realizes his or her sin and confesses the Lord Jesus Christ and is granted eternal life. That, that does happen. And sadly, I guess in one way, but joyfully in another, there are people that accept Christ, maybe younger, and due to some accident or mishap, uh, they die prematurely and are taken to the Lord's presence. But for the most part, individuals accept Christ and then there is a long life that follows that, a life of discipleship, a life that sometimes is filled with straight paths and sometimes with difficulties. And so Paul is describing this truth and he's describing his personal experience to the church at Corinth here in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffered. And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you also share in the comfort. 
We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again. While you join in helping us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, as we look to your word today, we acknowledge you as the God of all comfort. And as we see in these words today, that even the Apostle Paul, in fact, we know in the scripture, even the Lord Jesus was not immune to difficulties in this world. But the, we thank you, Lord, that these things will pass for those who have trusted in Christ. We thank you for the ministry of comfort that you give us in difficulty. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, 2 Corinthians is Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth that we have as part of the Holy Bible. But we know that at least there were two other letters that were written by the Apostle Paul that are mentioned in Scripture. Paul was very close to the church at Corinth. He had spent 18 months in Corinth, and we read about that in Acts chapter 8. If you spend a year and a half with the people, you begin to become very close to them, and Paul was very close to the church at Corinth. Now, Corinth was a city that was very wicked. It was a, a debaucherous type of city, wild living and the such. In fact, uh, we might compare it to what some people would say of Las Vegas and New Orleans today. Uh, the word uh, was simultaneous or was often um, mentioned as being wicked. In fact, to Corinthianize in that day meant to be a wicked person. But in the midst of that wicked city was a church. And Paul had worked with Aquila and Priscilla in developing the disciples there. And, and as Paul is writing the church, he's writing to encourage them. Now, while God was there in the midst of this light, in the midst of a dark city, God protected Paul. In fact, we read in Acts chapter 18 that God had placed people strategically in the city to protect Paul, that he may be able to continue his ministry there for months. Yet near the very end, as Paul was leaving the city, adversity began to strike the church. So the church at least Paul had been protected from it. But we read in Acts chapter 18 how Sosthenes, a synagogue ruler who had become a Christian, was persecuted. And so Paul is writing to the church here, and he's helping them to understand that the Christian life is not always easy, that there will be adversity, there will be difficulty. Sometimes that difficulty just happens out of nowhere. You're not doing anything uh, great, you're not doing anything not so much, and just difficulty hits you indiscriminately. Sometimes that difficulty comes when you make a stand for Christ, and you're making a stand as the light in a darkened way. Sometimes there are just no explanations, but none of us is immune to that. In fact, Paul says that true ministry in Christ will in seasons be accompanied by hardship, but there is victory and the victory comes not apart from suffering, but often it is preceded by suffering. In fact, many times the victory comes through suffering. That sounds difficult to our minds, but the scripture teaches that truth. So this morning, as we look at the subject of difficulties in the Christian life, I want to look at three truths that we can grasp as we study the word of God today. And the first is this, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ is not easy. No matter what age you live, it's not easy. But especially today, if you make a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not be easy. When I joined the cross country team the number of years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into. The first week, he, uh, the coach, I don't think he, he knew much about running because he had us running six or eight miles the first day we came out. And I literally came home and threw up each day. Pardon me, ladies, but I did. I got sick, and, and his mantra for the season was intestinal fortitude, but that first week, it felt like to me intestinal splatitude. I mean, 
it was, it was rough. I don't exaggerate. I would come right home and get sick. You know, the Christian life, it's not a sprint. It's a long distance run. And part of that is really difficult. You know, I was thinking uh, a couple of weeks ago as I was uh, preparing this message, few people when they trust Christ really understand what lies ahead. There's an excitement in accepting Christ, and it should be. But, but I accepted Christ in this chi- as a child. I didn't understand all that becoming a follower of Christ would entail. Years ago, there was a famous personality many people in that day knew. And this individual professed Christ. And so, shortly after he professed Christ, he went through a major professional crisis. It wasn't anything that he had done wrong. It wasn't anything that was a result of sin. He just went through a professional crisis and everyone knew it. My good friend Bruce Larson was pastoring in the area at that time. And we were talking about it. And Bruce He just always blesses me with wisdom. He said, you know, Rick, that is the best thing in the world that can happen to that young man because he needs to understand that the Christian life is not candy land. And it isn't. Many times the Christian life, uh, we're faced with difficulties. Jesus said, if one would be my disciple, let that person deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. You know, as I was thinking about this, I'm not a video game expert by any means, but the younger generation would understand this. When you're a video gamer, when you play games, the more you advance, the more challenges there are. That's just what happens. If you're at level one, it's pretty easy. You get up to level 14 or 15, the challenges. And the same thing is true of the Christian life. Sometimes we think the longer we live this Christian life, the easier it will be. But often the challenges become greater in this age. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 4, Paul says, God comforts us in all our affliction." Affliction is the Greek word thlipsis, and it literally speaks of a pressing in. Have you ever watched a suspense movie or show and somebody's in a room and the wall's closing in on both sides and your heart starts to race and you're thinking, is there an escape route? Is the floor going to drop off and they be safe? Will the ceiling open up and somehow they'll be drawn out of it and it keeps pressing in? Another picture of thlipsis we experience every day. If you have a certain type of toothpaste, you push both sides together. Now, some some people, you say you roll it up. No, I don't do that. I press it in. And when they press in, what happens? Something comes out. It's a pressure that's applied. Affliction speaks of an external pressure. So you're living your life and all of a sudden this external pressure comes out of nowhere. And Paul says that God comforts us in our affliction. Now, Paul is not speaking theoretically here. He's speaking experientially. Look at verse 8. He said, we don't want you to be ignorant, unaware, brothers and sisters of our affliction that took place in Asia. He says, we were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength. We even despaired of life itself. We felt we had received the death sentence, but notice what he learned from it. So that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God is saying there that what he learned from it, and he says later in the chapter about his thorn in the flesh, was even though he wouldn't choose it, even though he was overwhelmed by it, he learned through it to trust in God. And that course is a tough course, but when you graduate from it spiritually, there's a blessing in it. You know, when we go through difficulties, isn't it good to know that Paul said, look, I went through it. I don't know about you, but I, when I see the saints like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, when I see uh, Daniel and what he went through and we've been studying, and I look at Paul and what he went through, and I understand I'm not alone. In fact, many times, great disciples of the Lord, they go through difficulties. Gary Willett is a good friend of mine and a man that I admire. He lives near Martinsburg, West Virginia. And he works with a ministry called New Life Global Ministry. 
Now, a number of years ago, Gary had a very secure job in the pastorate financially, but God was leading him in faith to step out and begin a worldwide mission. And they do work in their immediate area all the way uh, to Asia. This past year has been a very difficult year for Gary. Uh, he is the type of man, he is a globe trotter for the Lord. He, he's ready to go at any moment, but he suffered in, from COVID about 18 months ago. And right now he is going through what you've heard described as long-term COVID. And he said, there's some days that I can't even see the daylight because my head feels like it's splitting open. There's some days he said, I may be in a teleconference and, and all of a sudden I can't even begin to think. He said, my mind can't think. And basically Gary has been tabled for about six to nine months, not able to go out and do the work. And he said, it's been tough, but God alerts us that we as disciples are not immune to difficulty. God's bringing him through that. God's teaching him through that. It's not a course any of us would, would volunteer and say, hey, I want to go through that course. But he's learning. But we know that God is with us in it. He tells us in Psalm 121, when it, that famous psalm, I'll lift up mine eyes into the hills from which cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord. What does he say? He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee does not slumber. Do you know God's awake to your situation today? He's aware and he's there. But I want you to see a second truth. As we go through this Christian life, we need to go forward in this life with a focus on God and what he is doing through every hardship, any and every hardship. We need to keep our focus on him. Do you realize that God has laid out the course for your life? One of the lessons that I learned in cross country is you better follow the course. Years ago, we were at Liberty High School in Bedford, Virginia, and uh, granted, I didn't see it because I was way behind. But the guy that won the race, when he came out of the wooded area, he had to circle the track. That was before the day of the asphalt track. It was a cinder or dirt track. It had rained much the day before. He had nice shoes. So he came out of that last stretch. He had to make about a three quarter circle around the track. And he had the brilliant idea that he would step inside the track and run along the grass rather than the muddy track. No one was within a hundred yards of him. I can still remember when that race was over and I got there a few minutes later, I was there. And I saw him with his head between his knees weeping because the course director said, you're disqualified. One step inside the track. You see, that young man learned he didn't determine the course. The course was determined for him. You know, when we trust Christ, we don't choose the course that we have. And really it's good because God in his sovereign will understands the course. He chooses it. Now, don't get me wrong. We do have choices. And when we make choices, though, we can't avoid the consequences of those choices. But I'll tell you this. There's mud and there are puddles that God has prescribed for us that we need to go through. We need to look to him, not at others. Not at others. Remember, Peter was talking about the disciple Jesus loved. What about him? Jesus, in effect, said, what I do with him is what I'm going to do with him. You keep your eyes on me, what, what you do. God's chosen a course. We don't choose it. If you're going to follow Christ, it isn't always going to be easy. Jesus himself said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. If Jesus went through difficulty, who are we to think that we would not? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, us, let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. What a blessing it was to be in a teleconference with Gary Willett and him say, man, this has been tough, but I'm looking to Jesus. I'm looking to him. You know, one of two things is true. If you're going through a difficulty now or whenever, 
Either your situation is consuming you or Jesus is consuming you. Either you're looking at Jesus through the lens of your situation or better, you're looking at your situation through the lens of Jesus. I confess that many times when I go through difficulty, my tendency would be to, to have pity or to look at self. We need to keep the Lord at the center. You know, we're headed somewhere. History's headed on a line. And if you're a Christian, you're headed to victory. One thing that I love in the Sunday school lesson today, I'd never thought about it before. In, in Daniel chapter 9, and I shared with the class, Daniel is praying for the Lord to hear. And what, is, what did Daniel want? Daniel wanted God bring us back to the land like you promised through the prophet Jeremiah. But you know what? If you read on in the end of Daniel, God had far better plans than just bringing him back because he says, I'm sending you Jesus. And he is the anointed one. And he is the one you want to be delivered out of this land just temporarily to go back to the land that I promised. But there's a greater land and there's a greater promise and there's a greater deliverance through sin, from sin, through Jesus Christ. We're headed somewhere. It's a new song, relatively new, uh, sung by Jordan Feliz. Jesus is coming back and I love it. I listened to it about three or four times in a row today. But the, it, it's a beautiful video. I, I think Teresa said she might try to sing it sometime. But it, it's a video that has people from all walks of life sharing testimonies at the end of that video. And he is singing and he's singing. And the verse goes like this. Keep your head up. Jesus is coming back. Don't you give up. Jesus is coming back. In the midst of difficulty, I want you to see Paul kept his eyes on Jesus. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. What is he doing? He's praising God. He, he's going through difficulty. He just said we were overwhelmed in Asia. We, we had the death sentence on us. This is the same letter he's writing later in this letter that I have a thorn in the flesh. Satan is buffeting me. In chapter 2, he's talking about this brother who had offended him and behind his back. He had problems with the church. He had to write him a painful letter because people were coming in and backstabbing him. He was having to defend himself. And in this same letter later in chapter 11, he says, man, I've suffered the 40 minus 1 last ashes three times. I've been shipwrecked. I've been abandoned by the brethren. And he can go through a list. I don't have the time to go through it. Paul is going through all of this. And what is he saying? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, gamer, but if you can get to that level, you're the champ. You're the champ. But not only that, he shares a testimony. Look at verse 10. He has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. A spiritual marker, he's delivered us. He did it before, he'll do it again. We put our hope in him that he will deliver us again. So he shares praise, and he shares a testimony. But I want you to see a third thing. As followers of Christ, we are to help each other. Hey, this life, it's a long life. Their dips, their difficulties. God has prescribed that course and he's with us. We need to keep our eyes on him. We need to praise him. We need to, share, we need to tell others about what he's doing. But I'll be honest, of all the three points, this third one is what really draws my attention to the passage. Paul says in verse 4, he comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those with any kind of affliction through the comfort we receive from God. What he's saying, God comforted me so that I can comfort you. We're to help each other in difficulties. Listen to this. If you don't get anything out of this morning's message other than Jesus, that's the most important thing. But second to that this morning is this. Don't ever waste a hardship. Don't ever waste it. Man, we aren't always good with this. Um, a few weeks ago, we don't open up a lot. Uh, I had a runny nose. It was not COVID, anything like that. I was down in the office here. I needed a tissue. You know, my first thought wasn't to go to the men's class. It's go to the women's class. They've got tissues in there. 
That's an indictment on us, men. We ought to be open. We need community. He's talking here not about the ministry of ushering. He's not talking about the, the ministry of going out and building something. He's talking about the ministry of comfort. Comforting and encouraging others for God's glory. When you go through a difficulty and God brings you through it, you can understand better that difficulty. So if someone after you goes through it, God can use you to encourage. Years ago, Karen and I claimed it. She was struggling with anxiety, which led to sleeplessness. So many in the church here was so wonderful to minister to her. But we had decided to claim Psalm 50, 15. Psalm chapter 50, verse 15, call me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you and you will honor me. Now, how do we honor God when he brings us through a hardship? I tell you, one of the primary ways is be an instrument to encourage somebody else later who goes through that same thing. Have you been through a difficulty in marriage? Comfort someone now who's going. Have you experienced the loss of a loved one? Comfort someone else who's going through it now. As God brought you through uh, not just the death of a loved one, but the prolonged illness of a loved one, if you've been through it, allow God to use you to comfort. We need that encouragement. And along with that encouragement is prayer, is prayer. In other words, he says in verse 11, while you join in helping us by your prayers, do you know someone that's being pressed in, afflicted today? Pray. Are you going through that yourself? Ask for prayer. I want to ask Paul to help me a minute. I left that book right there, Paul, if you'll handle it, or hand it rather to me. This morning, this is for the guys who were at the men's conference. This is, was added to me just this morning. But I was thinking about hardship. I recommend this classic devotional streams in the desert by L.B. Kalman. It's a classic along with my utmost for his highest. Ms. Kalman shares various things that were shared. And Hugh McMillan shared this entry. He says, speaking of plant life, amid the loneliness and barrenness of a high altitude exposed to the fiercest of winds, the lichen exhibits glorious color, color it would never have displayed had it been protected from it. He says, as I write these words, I have two specimens of the same type of lichen before me. And Ms. Calman is sharing this testimony from Mr. McMillan. One is from the St. Bernard area, a mountainous area, and the other is from the wall of a Scottish castle. The castle is surrounded by sycamore trees. The difference in their form and coloring while they're the same plant is strikingly different. The one grown amidst the fierce storms of the mountain peak has a lovely yellow color of a primrose, a smooth texture, and a definite form and shape, but the one cultivated amid the warm air and the soft showers of the lowland valley has a dull, rusty color, a rough texture, and an indistinct and broken shape. And he said, isn't that the same with a Christian who is afflicted, storm-tossed, and without comfort until the storms and difficulties allowed by God's providence, God's course, beat upon a believer again and again, his character will appear flawed and blurred. So as we go through our difficulty, understand this. If we live long enough, we'll face it. But when we face it, we keep our eyes on the Lord, following the example of Paul who praised God in the midst of it and who confidently shared the testimony God has delivered and he will deliver. And when God brings us through these things, we comfort others as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we have come to your word today, we thank you for this challenge from scripture. First, we want to thank you for the things that you have delivered us from. And Paul said that you comfort in the affliction so that we may be able to comfort others who are in a similar t kind of affliction. Lord, give us this ministry of comfort. Maybe you would place somebody on our mind, our heart today that we can do it. Lord, 
Help us to keep our eyes on you. And Father, we thank you for your word, for the truth of it. We thank you, Lord, that you have wonderful things in store for those who have trusted in you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Most important thing you can do in any trial or difficulty is cling to the rock, Jesus Christ.